Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm very excited today to bring you a lecture about something that I know you are extremely interested in, and that is female hormone optimization. With me today is Stefan Hartman and his beautiful fiance, Logan. Hi, and welcome. Hi. Hello. Glad to so be here. Yeah, I am so excited about this. Uh, I always have a fantastic time when we do our interviews. We've done the one about male hormone optimization and we've done other interviews in the past. So this is really, um, really important. And I know that people always are asking me about this topic. So can you share a little bit, Stefan and Logan, a little bit about your background? And, and then from there, we'll transition into the, the hormone lecture. Yeah, as you all know, I'm, I'm a PA and it's background in, back, in the bachelor's in exercise science. And I have a human performance and optimization approach to the primary care patient. And I feel that hormones are primary care, They're the basics of primary care. So I'm highly involved in testing and optimizing hormones, uh, both males and females. Logan is also a PA and uh, she also has done a lot of research of understanding female hormones. So we've attended the conferences, the anti-aging conferences, learned from them, but she's really done a lot of legwork in trying to figure this out for herself and her and, and females in, in general. Okay, fantastic. Okay. And you, did we miss I was going to say you pretty much hit on all that. Yeah, that's... Hmm. Love it. Um, and you are in Melbourne, Florida, but you do you do um, online uh, consults, right? I want to make sure that people know that uh, in the description box below are going to be all the links and uh, that they can see you not only in person, but also via Zoom. And you have other doctors working with you as well in other states that are that they are certified in other states as well. So we'll get to that again towards the end. But um, right now, let's yeah, let's just dive into all the good stuff. Let me share my screen if you can enable that for me. Right. Yes. I don't know why I have to do this every time. They should just. There we go. Yeah. You got it. All right. Here's our lecture. Female hormone optimization. <laughs> the great it. before and after. You like those pictures, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> oh, I love it. So can you share a little bit about your transformation, Logan? Yeah. So it's funny. Initially, um, I, well, the picture on the left, actually, I mean, that's pretty old, but that, it's not long ago that I still looked that way. Mm. And I actually made big lifestyle change, changes, not necessarily initially for the weight. I mean, that was an added benefit, but it was actually because I was having hormonal acne. And so I made a lot of dietary changes. Um, and then the weight just fell off along with that. Once the hormones were optimized, um, the weight just like fell off like 35 pounds in like a year. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. It was just an added benefit, you know, to the, um, the hormone changes. That's fantastic. And uh, it was uh, what you're going to talk to us about, right? All of yep. this. Update. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. We're going to start out with the female menstrual cycle. So Logan, if you could walk someone through this, a lot of women, they are not familiar with this chart or their cycles. Yeah. So I actually remember when we learned about this in school and I thought it was like the most confusing like thing ever. I was like, I don't know how people understand this but now it's it's crazy it's kind of like second nature and I, I think for all females like a cycle like this sh we should all know it well even if you're not a healthcare provider but you know for this is basically how a normal hormone cycle should take place but unfortunately that's typically not the case because so many women are either estrogen dominant or they're testosterone dominant or they're not even ovulating and so it tends to actually not follow suit but the way it should start is day one of your menstrual cycle, um, which is day one of your period, um, you sh that's when you're at your lowest hormones, right? So you're low on estrogen, low on progesterone, low on testosterone. The, the body signals to the pituitary that it's basically time to start that cycle over. And so you'll get a spike of FSH, which basically tells your body to start producing estrogen. And that's the first half of your cycle, right? The follicular phase. And so you'll, you should be getting a little bit of a slow estrogen spike. And so women tend to feel their best on this phase. Most of the time, if you ask them, this will be when they feel the best because 
they're getting that estrogen, their skin is looking nice and plump and hydrated. They have a good mood. They have a lot of energy. And then you get towards mid-cycle ovulation, which is generally around day 14. I mean, it could be, you know, a little bit before or after, but generally on day 14, women start to feel really good because not only they have the estrogen, but they get um, some testosterone as well. So, and that's basically because the body is wanting to make a baby, right? It's ovulating. And so you'll get a spike of testosterone as well to um, encourage sex drive, of course. And so women also tend to feel pretty good during ovulation. Um, and then with all that, you'll get a big spike of luteinizing hormone LH from the pituitary as well. Or so you should. A lot of women, unfortunately, are having issues where they're not ovulating, so they may not get that spike, but you should get an LH spike at mid-cycle as well during ovulation, and that is going to signal the start of progesterone secretion in the body. Hmm. Um, and so the latter half of your cycle it should be progesterone dominant, and progesterone is important for a lot of reasons as well. It promotes calming, um, promotes blood flow. It's actually a natural diuretic as well, and so it could help with bloating. So a lot of women in the latter half of their cycle will have significant bloating, um, which could be for more reasons than just low progesterone. But um, a lot of women suffer from low progesterone in that second half of the cycle. Stress is a big factor as well, but we'll get into all that. Um, and then towards you know day 26, 27, 28, the progesterone starts to slow down and all the estrogens come low and then you, you bleed, you menstruate. And then it starts over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very simplified, quick version. It's, it's maybe a little bit more complex than that, but that's a quick rundown of the cycle. Beautiful. Love it. And yeah, it's it's uh, funny how long it takes us to to remember those spikes in hormones. I sometimes I still have to kind of refresh my memory and be like, wait, is it the LH or is it the FSH right now? And mm -hmm. uh, But yeah, you're right. We all should have a very easy time with this all women should you know mm -hmm. because it influences so much of every area of our mood and our health yeah. absolutely yeah you should also note when women are fertile right which yeah. is generally i mean everybody again may be a little bit different you know day by day as far as during that ovulatory period but generally it's around you know days 10 to 14 when you're ovulating you're only really truly fertile for a couple of days during the cycle, right? You're not going to get pregnant at any at any day during the cycle. It's got to be during that time period um, where you're ovulating, where you're actually going to be fertile and, and can um, yeah. get pregnant. Yeah. And I think that can be very empowering for women who are trying to avoid hormonal contraceptives, which we're going to get into in a second here and the damages they do. You're not, yeah. you're not able to get pregnant any day of the month. Yeah, this is something, this is a conversation I have to have with so many of my clients um, who come to me just, usually it's just for weight loss, you know, but then they're usually also on a birth control pill. And I, the first thing I do is like, listen, you have to understand the side effects. You have to understand what's going on right now and what you're setting yourself up for. Um, and then the next question is like, well, then what else can I do? You know, what, what are the other options? So if you're going to talk about that, I'm, that's very exciting. Yes, we will. The other thing, uh, very logistically for, for testing labs, we want to test on day 21. Now, why do we want to do that? Because we'll be able to measure progesterone to estrogen ratio. The women test their labs on day 21. Unlike men, men can go any day of the month, doesn't matter, right? Test a testosterone. Women has to be on day 21 for us. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, <laughs> I went through the literature for this lecture really trying to find, you know, what is optimal female hormones. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of interest in this, in uh, the literature, right? Female hormones, we wouldn't have civilization without them, but there seems to be a real negligence among our academics and our institutions. And no one's really paying attention to female hormones here, um, which is real unfortunate. We have some studies, yes, uh, but not as much as we should. Yeah, and most studies usually end up anyway being done on males um, because the, the the excuse is always that we don't want a lot of confounding variables with the changing hormones. And so let's just mm -hmm. stick with an all male. You know, I think this thing is, is starting slowly to change with a more focus on women's health. But yeah, there's definitely a huge disparity in the published literature. 
Yeah. yeah. We're going to start it here with a striking case study of a 60-year-old lady who came to me with clawed hands. She couldn't move them because they were in so much pain. She had raw hands. She'd been to the dermatologist. They did a workup. They said it was a contact dermatitis. They gave her some steroids. She was doing these steroids for years. It wasn't really getting better. I came to her and I was like, well, this seems to have happened when you entered menopause. She entered menopause a little bit later, about age you know, 55. And I was like, listen, why don't we do topical estradiol of the hands? So I got a compounded estradiol cream. We put it onto the hands every day. And about two to three months later, this was the result. You can see on the bottom, her hands are uh, pretty much cured. Uh, she's very happy with this result. This is an, a, a testament to how estrogen is more than just a sex hormone. You think, of, oh, it's just sex and, and children and, and that sort of thing. Well, no, it helps with collagen synthesis, tissue repair. It's immunomodulatory. Besides that, it's joint protective. It builds bone. It's cardioprotective. It's neuroprotective. I think this is a visually striking case to put that in people's minds. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. The power of hormones. Um, yeah. This is something I've noticed a lot also, like with keto rashes, when people do keto or carnivore and they get rashes. And I do think it has something to do also with some hormonal changes that happen. Oftentimes it, it goes away by itself. And I'm not sure how close that is to contact dermatitis. Um, but I feel like for some people, it, when it doesn't go away, then I would look into hormonal regulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she did the dietary changes that we talked about here before, doing more of an animal-based diet, getting rid of the sugars. Um, so she did some dietary changes as well. Nice. So let's look. What does a 29-year-old healthy female hormone panel look like? <laughs> some anxiety, stress, likely due to environmental factors. Stressful jobs, is this you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we see here. A total testosterone of 34, that's pretty good. What you can maybe hope for it with natural testosterone total in women. A free testosterone of 1.5. That's pretty good what we can expect in this mm -hmm. modern age. I don't really see too much above this. I have seen maybe some outliers, some, some women in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. naturally, maybe some older women like this. But for the most part, this is pretty good as far as a natural testosterone level. Here's estrogen. 195 and 227. This is pretty good for a day 21 of estradiol. We can see the reference ranges here. Um, and of course, they always change depending on where we measure them, but we always measure them on day 21. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this was when I was in ketosis too. So, uh, you yeah. were in ketosis here. Yeah. Hey. Your progesterone of 17.5 is excellent. Right. So uh, again, a luteal phase progesterone anywhere between 1.8 to 2.3 is, is too big a range. Mm -hmm. Or optimal progesterone would be pretty much where we're seeing it right now. Again, we can always calculate the estrogen to progesterone ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're looking at here is a pretty good level of hormones. DHEF 260, it's pretty good. Okay. So your B12, very high here. This is from beef liver, isn't it? Yeah, well, and I, I was for a period taking a methylated B vitamin, so that's probably also playing into that. But yeah, it's beef liver as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was, um, was that with supplementation? So the B12, I had stopped it probably a month before that. So, I mean, you, I, it could have still been maybe some stores in there, but at that time, technically, no, I wasn't. Gotcha. And uh, your vitamin D is amazing. It's so mm -hmm. rare to see such a fantastic reading there, mm -hmm. 76. Um, yeah, like yeah. most people that come to me, um, they, and they, it's usually in the 20s or 30s. If they're lucky, it's in the 40s, and they think it's normal because right, uh, right they don't flag it as too low yeah. with the standard lab ranges. So, yeah. Which is interesting because even when I worked in internal medicine, even the internist that I worked with, she was very conventional, but she knew that 30s and 40s was still too low. We would supplement people with like 10,000 units a week if they were below 40. Because she, even she knew that that was a, a poor reference range. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I think the tide is slowly, slowly changing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is your 
salivary panel. Yeah, but that and that one was not at the same time as the ones we just reviewed, just for reference. Uh, this was way back. When. Yeah, this was almost a year ago. Yeah, so what we saw was a high morning cortisol, 3.98. We saw kind of a, a low end of uh, your salivary testosterone at 11. Mm -hmm. Your estradiol of 1.7. That's kind of what we can expect with uh, a salivary uh, hormone panel. Um progesterone of 93 uh, perhaps a little bit on the low end there mm -hmm. yeah a little bit on the low end there let's see what else we have here um oh this was on this was in ketosis this is on ketosis mm -hmm. interesting what happened to her on ketosis is her cortisol went up a little bit maybe uh, greater than 10 and again it could be from the job the stress of the job mm -hmm. It could have I, been from... I think it could be also withdrawals. So when you go on a mm -hmm. keto or carnivore, you do enter a stage of withdrawal and you have the first few weeks, which is the acute phase, but then really you have the post-acute phase, which can last up to years. Mm -hmm. And so I've noticed that, yeah, cortisol definitely goes up, but I think that if we just stay patient with it, oftentimes, eventually it regulates as you, as your brain recalibrates away from the drugs, away from the, um, you know, sugars and anything that's addictive. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, and this definitely was very acute phase. I mean, only like four weeks into ketosis. And again, and we have that on the top, you know, my job is very stressful, which thankfully I'm transitioning out of, but that's clearly playing a role in, in my you know, cortisol, because actually, if you look at my sex hormones, my progesterone is pretty good. And so is my estradiol. So they're actually really good. It's just, you it's know, it's better on, on keto. Here. It, Your estradiol went from 3.4. It was 1.7. on the Yeah. Side. I mean, and I felt excellent at the time of, I mean, I felt better. So I, I do think it is more of an acute phase reaction to get that high cortisol because you're making it a very big change in, in what your body is using as fuel. And so it's going to react that way, of course. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and that's, that's been my belief lately. And uh, it, it, you, it's impossible not to have a certain level of stress when you are removing all the carbs, all the sugars, all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. All right. We're going to get into here some case studies with female hormonal contraceptives. And the reason we have to do case studies is that there's a lack of data. In the 70s and 80s, there were some studies looking at serum levels of hormones in the blood on women taking oral contraceptives, but it seems that sort of interest faded after the 80s. Hmm. Um, but what they found in the literature is, yes, you would get suppressed estrogen levels, you would get suppressed progesterone levels uh, taking um, oral contraceptives. Hmm. Yeah, there's, there's more an interest in looking at the benefits, right, of getting on the pill because that's where the money is and there's uh, more of a profit to be made if we pump out those studies. But it's, it's not as, uh, it's not like an even balanced um, approach, unfortunately. It's the same thing we see in nutrition, same thing we see in pretty much all the science, right? And so this is why we don't see as many studies looking at the negative effect, the long-term negative effects, all the reasons why you should think twice before you get on the pill. Right. And yeah, patients come to me and they'll have gone to their regular practitioner and asked, can you test my hormones? And they're like, you don't need to test hormones. You're on birth control. That's right. what they'll be told. Well, right. wait, well, just for curiosity's sake, and like for scientific purposes, there's no intellectual curiosity anymore. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this fascinating case study. This is a female bodybuilder. I love bodybuilders because they are at the top end biohacking. They understand their labs. They know hormone optimization. So this is a female bodybuilder on birth control. And she went on testosterone replacement therapy because her testosterone was suppressed on birth control. So we can see here kind of a super physiologic dose for a female, a total of 118. Wow. And a free of 2.8. Uh, this she had been doing that for a while she was actually getting some deepening of the voice and so she does go off it and she's doing a much lower dose now right she, she um and she's still on birth control still on birth control hmm. yeah still doing testosterone replacement just yeah. because her testosterone was crushed on birth control 
And as a bodybuilder, you need testosterone. Right. You need testosterone in general. Mm -hmm. Right. Was she getting any acne or any other symptoms besides the the deepening of the voice when it was no. 118? No, no, just deepening wow. of the voice. I remember the reason why I uh, got off the acne medication. The last acne medication I tried was pironolactone. And I ran my labs uh, years ago, and I had almost no DHEA to speak of, which is that male sex hormone similar to testosterone that you absolutely need, you know, for everything. And uh, that's when um, the anti-aging doctor that I saw was a, you know, that's that's from the spironolactone you're taking. And that same day, I quit. I stopped. And that kind of forced me to look into my diet closer and understand that, you know, no pill is going to be the solution. Yeah. And you can see here, her estrogen is in postmenopausal ranges uh, on wow. birth control. So 15 and 33, which is what they found in the 70s and 80s. And they thought, oh, this is this is okay. It, they, they shouldn't have any harmful effects uh, at 30s and 15s. I mean, you're putting a young woman in a menopausal range for estradiol. <laughs> I mean, crazy. Crazy to me. it's yeah. a bit odd. Yeah. Here's her progesterone you know, a one. So that's very low. And kind of what you could see from a replacement dose of progesterone. I'll see this in women mm -hmm. who I put on progesterone at an older age. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll get a level of about one. But as we saw from, from Logan's results, you should be looking at 17. You should have a progesterone at 17. This won't yeah. fluctuate. This will stay stable when you're on birth control. Right? So this yeah. is perhaps why general practitioners, they say you don't need the test hormones because we know what it's going to be at it's going to be low and you right. can almost think of it as like it's it's going to like accelerate their aging right if you you're taking away all of their body's natural sex hormones you're you're going to like accelerate their aging in addition to putting them at risk for you know um blood clots and, and other issues but you you're almost accelerating their aging when you're taking away oh, yeah. these, these natural hormones they produce yeah, it's like early onset menopause, right? I remember working um, at the University of Miami on this project for a few months. Um, it was rehabilitating stroke victims. And uh, all of the stroke patients that we worked with, it made sense because they were middle-aged or older or much older, um, had comorbidities, you know, weight gain, etc. And the only outliers were... I think it was two or three young women in their 20s, super fit, no health issues, nothing. The only commonality between them is that they were all on birth control, mm -hmm. you know, and they had the stroke in their 20s, which is shocking, you know? Shocking. It's devastating. Yeah. 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 I don't recommend birth control, but if you're going to do it, you should probably also do TRT. It makes sense because you're shutting down all the hormones and you were just going to yeah. forget about testosterone. Probably not. Get it measured. I'm suspecting it's going to be low. Um, this this bodybuilder, she figured it out. Uh, progesterone on fertility. So progesterone is the fertility hormone. Women who are difficult having difficulty conceiving or maintaining a pregnancy, sometimes the OB will even give them shots of progesterone, intramuscular injections of progesterone to help maintain a pregnancy. So it's pretty critical for that. Okay. So, the main uh, difficulty I find with women getting off birth control is their progesterone is low. And they have a real hard time conceiving. It doesn't always come back. If you think about it, if you put a guy on testosterone replacement therapy, what it does is it suppresses their natural way to produce testosterone. It seems like the same thing happens when you put a woman on birth control. And no one talks about this. You get canceled on the internet for saying this, but it suppresses your natural ability to produce it. So getting off the birth control, yeah, sure. Some guys, they can get on testosterone. They can hop off it. They'll be perfectly fine. Most guys need to do post-cycle therapy. There's no post-cycle therapy for a woman getting off oral contraceptives or any sort of contraceptive device. Why? I don't know. It blows my mind. Hmm. So let's look at this female. Uh, no, birth, uh, <laughs> no birth control, acne on face. Okay. 17-year-old female. Uh, she has a very high estrogen almost no progesterone. So what is going on here? This is very interesting. Mismatch of her hormones going on here. Uh -huh. uh, what are the risks of unopposed estrogen? Okay, you can get 
endometrial proliferation. You can get nostalgia, breast pain. Um, you, you can actually drive malignancy. Right, um, cancers. Yeah, so you need to treat the estrogen dominance. There's certain herbs that you can cycle. But then again, again, you need to think about where are you getting all this excess estrogen? Is mm -hmm. it xenoestrogens, a plastic, perfumes? Or excess weight, of uh, course. Yeah, yeah, she didn't have excess weight. Right, uh, right. It, a bit that that ratio is way off there oh yeah that's astronomically high astronomically yeah. and you can't imagine she feels good on that either i mean with that much estrogen and that low of progesterone she's she's got to feel terrible yeah, yeah. but the, you know the conventional approach for this would be i just put them on doxycycline or something for the acne on the face but we do test hormones here and you can find some interesting things when you look at the hormones yeah yeah you gotta treat the the root cause first you know because you can't you can't be on on like some form of a band-aid for life you have to understand what is driving that you know and that's really how i got into um eventually carnivore but that's the first time i strayed away from what i was being taught in nutrition school uh, because I was dealing with acne and I did Accutane twice and I did, I did, I think they put me on tetracycline for three months, um, spironolactone mm -hmm. for two, I mean, everything I've taken, birth control I've done for three months, nothing worked. Um, and that's when I realized like maybe this traditional mainstream view of nutrition and medicine, there's something wrong there. And that's where I started reading books and getting on the internet, doing all the research. And it took a long time. And I did paleo first and then discovered keto and then eventually carnivore. So you gotta, you gotta dig deeper. You have to understand what is the root cause because if you just put a bandaid on it, you might get some clearing of acne. I personally never got any clearance at all. Um, but even if you do get some clearance, it's like, what are you going to take the pill and the side effects for life? Or are you going to figure out what's driving that root cause? Because eventually other conditions are going to spring up that mm -hmm. are driven from the same root cause, you know, things faster and become worse and worse to treat. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a way to calculate the progesterone to estrogen ratio on either way, a lot of ways to calculate but healthy women should be between uh, 100 and 500. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is another one. She had difficulty conceiving a child previously. She'd like to have another child. Um, yeah, let's see. What do we do for her? Um, let's see, DHEA looked okay. Oh, and this is the other lady. Oh, my slides are messed up. Let's see. No, I think we're moving on to growth hormone optimization. Let's see. Okay, so we have this 57-year-old lady. She had an IGF-1 of 106. And so we used CJC hypomorelin for her. She said it improved her life tremendously. Uh, she did Those two are the peptides, right, that stimulate the, the secretion of your own growth hormone? Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, her growth hormone, IGF-1 of 106, very low, almost uh, adult growth hormone deficiency level or, or cutoff level. So she did a couple cycles of this. Uh, she feels great, sleeps well. The sleep is what we notice first and foremost when we give them growth hormone peptides and we increase their growth hormone, they sleep better. Mm -hmm. so the growth hormone, it declines with age. And, uh, we always think oh, when you get older, you don't sleep as well. Well, if you give them the growth hormone back, they sleep again. Mm -hmm this every day the mk677 which is another growth hormone peptide it actually did nothing for your career so we experimented with different ones i've so, heard so much about mk677 why is everyone talking about it because it's orally available you don't have to inject it like cjc gotcha yeah uh, we tried a cjc if we're in los Angeles, it didn't do anything you got to inject it unfortunately mm -hmm. she also noticed improved skin elasticity more muscle definition even her edema on the legs was growing down. Mm -hmm. uh, very cool. Uh, this is another 64-year-old lady. She did a cycle of CJC ipomorelin and GHK copper, which is a copper peptide. And she healed uh, wounds on her leg. They had been there for five years. And the wounds healed right up. But just wow. uh, about a week of you cycling these peptides. Um, wounds as in diabetic wounds? No, just wounds. I mean, she probably, who knows why she had it. It was just thin skin. 
Right. Or perfusion. Yeah. Right. Uh, GHK copper helps with perfusion, angiogenesis, and wow. collagen synthesis. Okay. Let's see, young female, 32, uh, low progesterone. Mm. Let's see here. We got a cortisol level, a little bit high in the morning. See this so routinely, huh? You know that high cortisol. <laughs> progesterone, uh, progesterone, estrogen ratio, very low. Uh, let's see where her progesterone is at. Oh, 64. Uh, it's kind of low. Mm -hmm. Poor girl. Let's see how we're going to help her here. Okay. So she's pregnant. This is a surprise. Well, how did we do this? We did this thing called recycled Vitex. Vitex is an herb. It's a thousand year old herb, also known as chase tree berry, uh, Vitex venefri. And it's an herb that you can cycle throughout the month to increase natural progesterone, right? Dosage range between 200 up to 1,200 milligrams. And it naturally improves progesterone. It's known as um, a fertility herb. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to for people to understand why. So what it does is it interacts with the HPA axis, which is basically this, this delicate axis of the way your body and your pituitary and your hypothalamus all communicate because it's a cascade. You know, the hypothalamus tells the pituitary to release this, the pituitary releases it and acts on that organ. So what it does is it basically communicates with the pituitary to actually secrete LH, which if you guys remember from the beginning is, is going to stimulate ovulation, right? It's that st LH spike that stimulates progesterone. And so that's what it does is it modulates that HBA axis to help the body start releasing LH, whereas maybe before it wasn't, which of course, if you're not releasing that, you're not going to ovulate. It's going to be harder to get pregnant. So that's kind of the backstory on that. Interesting. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's a great little herb. Huh. These are some of the fascinating changes that happen in pregnancy. So progesterone increases during the time of the pregnancies. The further along in weeks, the higher the progesterone goes. This is a real problem for some women who don't get that progesterone increase. Mm. You cannot maintain a pregnancy if the progesterone doesn't come up. And this results in miscarriage if it doesn't cooperate. Other thing that will increase is the HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. That's another thing you measure to check how far along they are in the week's gestation. Okay. Another interesting thing to note is insulin resistance happens in pregnancy. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. They'll actually have high insulin levels. Right? So this is lady I accidentally ordered an insulin level on her. I didn't mean to, but I kind of, because uh, I know she isn't insulin resistant, but there it is at 25. Mm -hmm. Do you think and that I, that would happen in a carnivore or keto pregnancy? Yeah. Yep. You would still have, you would still have insulin resistance even, even if you take out the carbs. I think so. Well, and I was going to touch on that. I think that speaks to the fact, though, that in pregnancy, it's it's funny because we always kind of like jokingly like say women should eat whatever they want when they're pregnant or women, you know, they have this craving, so they should just binge on that. But I think that actually speaks to the fact that you should actually be that much more careful about what you're eating and your carbohydrate intake just because you're pregnant doesn't mean you need more carbs doesn't mean you need to gorge on the sugar and the carbs i think you actually maybe a little bit controversial but you might need to be actually even more careful about how much carbohydrates you're intaking because the body is naturally going to produce more insulin but i still think you can control that on, on a lower carbohydrate diet it doesn't mean every woman needs to be keto or carnivore when they're pregnant but i do think that means that we ha really have to be aware of our carbohydrate intake because that's how gestational diabetes develops. Exactly. So it just and and it's like I said, I we've got to get out of this notion of like pregnant women should just eat whatever they want because mm -hmm. if you really want a, a healthy pregnancy and healthy baby, you should actually be really aware of what you're eating. I mean, women deal all the time with these metabolic syndromes that happen mm -hmm. in pregnancy. They suddenly have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. They have gestational diabetes. They never had this before. What's going on? Well, you're insulin resistant. It's uh, yeah. part of being pregnant. It just speaks to adapting to the changes that are going to happen with your body, right? Yeah. You know, you may not, you can't, you can't keep doing the same things you were doing and expect a healthy pregnancy when you're you're eating all these carbohydrates. You you are going to cause metabolic disturbances. Yeah, 
Agreed. And if we just look at the rates of diabetes, if you've ever had gestational diabetes, you're far more likely to actually develop full-blown diabetes later on in life. So what does that tell us, you know? Um, yeah, like we, we, we need to be very careful. I think what happens is that your body's more sensitive during pregnancy maybe. And so it's kind of giving you the, those warning signs early on and uh, that should be a red flag. And yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, um, yeah, she had a healthy pregnancy. Nice. Okay. So let's look at, is testosterone responsible for athletic success in female athletes? This is definitely an area of controversy right now with all the transgender athletes right. entering sports. Uh, yeah, it's clearly a uh, athletic performance boost, right? You have more testosterone, you have higher muscle mass, you'd be stronger, can go longer. And uh, who has studied this? Well, it's not a, it's not the conventional. The conventional, if you search serum testosterone birth control, if you're trying to figure this out, no one's really looked at this. Wow. But you know who has? The DDR, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik. <laughs> they, this is a, you, I'll send you this link. You should read this article. They did so many experience experiments on the female athletes with androgens and anabolic steroids. If you want to learn about. <laughs> Is there stop? anything the Germans haven't thought about already? I mean, uh, the, my the, the, husband the, is German too. And so like he watches all the documentaries, everything is like, it's wild. All the things that they were doing such a long time ago, you know, all the ways that they were thinking of constantly, kind of like the, the original biohackers in a way. Well, yeah, the DDR was a small communist country and the only way to make notoriety was to excel in sports. So they had a very methodical doping program in the DDR and they, they did all this research of anabolic steroids, testosterone in women, what happens, their athletic feats. And yeah, they figured out testosterone obviously has a performance advantage in their athletes and women. Hmm. <laughs> So we know that the, there's some changes in age uh, with hormones, especially in the old aging female. Uh, you're going to see lower testosterone. Estrogen pretty much is, is gone. Unless you're very overweight, you can make uh, estrogen from your own fat cells. But for the most part, estradiol doesn't exist. Progesterone definitely doesn't exist in the aging female. Uh, but we know that a lot of age-related diseases are related to a lack of these hormones. The most obvious one and well-known even conventionally is bone mineral density. And we know that estrogen can help improve bone mineral density. However, the standard of care is not yet estrogen replacement. No, the standard of care evidently, according to our colleagues, is an SSRI, not hormone replacement. An antidepressant. That's yeah. Right. What? Yeah, I, in a physician assistant group that we were in on Facebook, that was a case that their colleagues were talking about that that the standard of care is an SSRI, not HRT. So that's what you have to look forward to for unfortunately a lot of women that go into menopause um, is an SSRI instead of uh, hormone replacement, which is it's crazy. Yeah, nuts. They yeah. they banned me in that group. <laughs> they did. I can see that happening. <laughs> yeah, I just asked a simple question. And yeah, I kind of got a lot of pushback from them about how dangerous HRT is. And I'm like, you know, you, you might think that that's the case, but you're also recommending a medication with potential side effects. So yeah, What's very the side effect of an SSRI. Yeah, suicide. so that's what, I mean, yeah, so you, exactly, you increase suicidality the first month of use, um, increase risk of bleeding actually in some of them, impotence. I mean, they all have side effects. So, yeah, it's just interesting. A lot of the bad reputation for hormones comes from these equine estrogens and the progestins and the synthetic estrogens. They did a lot of studies in the 50s on these, and women got heart attacks and they got strokes mm -hmm. and they got cancers. Yeah. And so we don't, we don't do that anymore. We mm -hmm. don't use these synthetic hormones. Well, except if you're premenopausal and you want contraception, you'll get synthetic hormones. Uh, but we don't do it for hormone replacement. Uh, what we do, at least in functional medicine, is we do bioidentical hormones. So, I mean, that's a, that's a hot term, but it, basically it's, they're synthesized from yams, these tubers. Uh, so, so I guess 
if you think of them like that, they're a little bit more natural. Well, they, they mimic. They, they mimic, mimic. The, the identical molecule that the body makes. That's the Precisely. Idea. They mimic the 3D molecular structure, you know, these, these organic chemistry structures of the hormones rather than mm. giving a synthetic one. Yeah. Uh, so here's a 45-year-old female. She's mm -hmm. perimenopausal. She's got night sweats and fatigue. She can't sleep. She's drenched in sweat at 2 to 4 a.m. And has been on and off for six to eight months. So it sounds like she's entered perimenopause. Uh, she eats um, a varied diet. She wants to lose some weight. So we can see here her salivary hormone. She has no testosterone left. Um, she has no estrogen left, no estradiol. Uh, her progesterone is pretty much gone as well. It's postmenopausal progesterone. So what do we do for this lady? Do we give her an SSRI, an <laughs> antidepressant? No. <laughs> We gave her a topical hormone replacement cream, a biest, estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. We gave it all back to her. Uh, her testosterone came up to 64. Her estradiol is 6.3. Uh, her progesterone is 484. So she's at levels of a healthy young woman again. Wow. She says it's been an absolute life change for me. She says I haven't felt this good mentally, physically, and just overall in probably over a year. I haven't had any night sweats or PMS issues. Wow. Which I should point out, it's not safe to have persistent night sweats. It actually increases your cardiovascular risk the more night sweats you have. Really? Okay. Yeah. So it's not just, oh, something uncomfortable you have to deal with. Uh, no, it's a cardiovascular risk factor. Wow. Treat it. Estrogen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She says her energy level is higher. She's lost 13 pounds. She has more energy. So we have a great success story here. And routinely, this is what I find. With rare exception, do we not see some positive effect with hormone replacement? We talk about number needed to treat in medicine, right? You look at statin drugs. You know, Sarah, you get a lot of a pushback online. But, oh, the cholesterol and, the, and the, you know, statins, they work. Well, the treatment number for statins is very high to treat you need to treat about, oh, 100 patients to save one life of a heart attack. So, but with hormone replacement, I found if I treat 10 patients, pretty much 10 patients will have a positive response to it. So that number needed to treat is pretty darn good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, let's see. Her morning cortisol finally came up. Is that the same person or no, somebody else? Yeah, same, same lady here. Oh. We tried to prove her DHEA because it was so low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's doing well on a repeat laboratory analysis. Um, all looks all looks pretty good in order. Her estradiol came up. Or estriol is a little bit high, but estradiol looks good. Um, okay. So she noticed her. She's still having some hot flashes. Okay. But her strength is coming up. Okay. She's able to do more lat pull downs and her muscle is growing. So okay. she's replacing fat with muscle, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to another patient. Uh, wait, this is, this is the same one. She didn't might, I was going to say it might have started um, backwards. It may have started backwards. Or, yeah. Oh, no, because she was 45, the other patient. So this is a different one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a different one. Yeah, I remember this one. This one's 63. So this lady has had poor sleep for 20 years on amitriptyline. She has GERD, asthma, and hypertension. What is amitriptyline? It's tricyclic antidepressant. Gotcha. They use it off-label for all sorts of things like headaches, pain, pain. Yeah. Okay. pain. Who it. knows? I don't even think she knows why she got on this stuff. Patients get on all this junk and they have no idea why they're even taking it. Yeah. They're just on all this stuff. She was on a lot of stuff. Uh, she she went up, got up to 253 pounds during the lockdowns, and she's only managed to lose about 11 pounds. She's had a gastric bypass and lost 180 pounds uh, from that. So she uses amitriptyline for sleep. She uses omeprazole, an acid-blocking medicine for reflux. She uses an Advair inhaler for her asthma. She uses Montelukas, which is a mast cell stabilizer. It also works for asthma. She has on Losartan, which is an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker for blood pressure, and amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, also for blood pressure. She's using an app. 
So we need to fix this lady. I'm like, okay, we, we got a lot of work to do. So I put her on this herbal cleanse called Biocide and help clear out some overgrowth of yeast and bacteria that people will get from using omeprazole for decades. Because it limits, it, it decreases your stomach acidity. So you you ingest more yeast and more bacteria and to colonize your, your small intestine. So I use this pretty routinely for these people to get them off these things. Right, because all the, the reflux medications, they were never designed to be used more than two weeks ever. Even like the manufacturers right. will tell you that. But because people and this condition is growing um, so much, it's becoming far more prevalent. They yeah. don't know. The doctors don't know what to do. So it's like, just take more, you know, take more acid blockers just to get mm -hmm. that relief for the heartburn. Yeah, you yeah. can buy omeprazole in bulk at Costco now. Wow. It's, yeah. I think like one of the top three or uh, most commonly prescribed medications are uh, reflux medications, uh, acid blockers, yeah. you know? Yeah, and then what, what happens is that if you are blocking stomach acid, so now your stomach can't pump out enough acid to digest your food fully, if you can digest your food, it's going to ferment. How is it going to ferment? I mean, you've got yeast and you've got bacteria that are going to take advantage of the fact that you can't absorb this food. They're going to try and break it down to get that, that nutrition from it. And now you've got SIBO or dysbiosis, which means uh, dysbiosis is an imbalance in your gut bacteria or SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or everything. You generally get everything, you know, and now your gut microbiome um, has been uh, jeopardized. And that is literally the root cause of pretty much every single chronic disease you can think of. We also got her on an ancestral diet. Okay, we, I told her, if you cut out all this sugar, all this carbs, you'll notice your blood pressure gets better in about two weeks. I see this routinely. Mm -hmm. And I say, you'll be able to monitor your blood pressure. Guarantee you'll be yeah. able to get up if you do this right. True. I have to warn my clients. I, I tell them, be careful if you're taking blood pressure medication. It's going to normalize so fast. So if you're still taking the medication, but now you don't have blood pressure. You pass out. Pressure, yeah. You're going to be careful. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's see. For sleep. I said, let's do progesterone hmm. and get you off the amitriptyline. If that doesn't work, we think of us and growth hormone peptides. So let's see how she is. So she did also everything else. She did colostrum and collagen is always part of my protocol. Some digestive enzymes. I reintroduced these for people because they don't have those enzymes so much. They don't digest well. Um, she's off the amlodipine. She's off the omeprazole. She's still on the steroid inhaler. Her blood pressure has been... Pretty darn good. That's not hypertensive anymore off of I'm living. Diastolic 76, 73. That's pretty low for a diastolic. Um, she's still on the low sartan, and uh, that's causing a little bit of a low potassium. She still has very low testosterone or low testosterone, uh, low pregnenolone. So we're going to do a comprehensive hormone replacement for her. We're going to increase the progesterone to 200. Uh, we're going to do estradiol, one milligram. Testosterone, one milligram, DHEA, 25 milligram, pregnenolone, 10 milligram, all transdermally. Mm. And uh, we noticed that her glucose, her fasting glucose came down, went from 95 to 85. And her testosterone has come up, estrogen has come up, DHEA is up, her vitamin D is still low. Where's her <laughs> vitamin D? Vitamin D, I don't know if it's here. Her growth hormone is still very low as well, so we're still considering maybe doing something like that. Okay. Vitamin D, oh, it just says it's still low. It doesn't say the number. Okay. She she was getting a little bit of a, a breast tenderness, mm -hmm. so I advised her to apply a topical leucose iodine, and that improved. It was just a lack of iodine. Interesting. Um, and she's also got off the all the blood pressure medicines. Um, so we discontinued all these medications for her. So she got all this, all this junk she got off of it. So now wow. she's just doing hormone replacement creams. Do you remember how long it took her to also stop the antihypertension um, medication? Yeah. yeah, no, the Losartan was the last one to come off, but it came off probably last around a month or two. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all of yeah. these things, she cut off all of these drugs that were... Yeah, that's she got off all the... And she taught, told me the other day her sex drive is come back. She says, wow, I feel like I'm in my 30s again. Wow. My husband can't keep up. <laughs> she feels fantastic. Um, she did get a little bit of, uh, you know, a bit of menstrual bleeding, actually. 
So I talked to the company pharmacist and I was like, you know what? I think we should remove the pregnenolone and perhaps reduce the dose of progesterone. And that's something that can happen is sometimes, I mean, it's a sign also of good health, right? It's, it's a sign of health that this is happening, but we're just going to reduce those to negate that one drawback that can sometimes happen if pregnenolone, progesterone, uh, those doses are too high. Right. But other than that, she feels fantastic and taking no pharmaceuticals now. Wow. So yeah, Logan kind of created this, how to optimize progesterone in premenopausal women. So premenopausal women, we don't use progesterone. We use vitamins. We use nutrients. We use herbs. Okay. We try to improve the diet. Mm -hmm. Right. We try to help them with their weight and their insulin. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not like a... Not everybody's a one size fits all and not every single thing is going to work for every single person. And for the most part, optimizing progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone is going to be a lot of overlap of the same things. But, you know, specifically for progesterone, of course, you really have to work on stress. I think that's a big, 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 big one that really, uh, I mean, most of us are stressed um, and a little bit of stress is okay and normal, but it's about how you recover from it. So many people have trauma or they have stressful lives and jobs and relationships. And it really, really messes with that delicate HPA axis. And so women will have a lot of issues with progesterone. And then of course they'll get anxiety, PMS, PMDD. They'll have all sorts of issues with ovulation. And so you've got to work on stress. So there's a little tidbit in there about managing, you know, um, stress with adaptogenic herbs, mindfulness. And of course, like every, all of the hormones, optimizing weight and insulin, circadian rhythm, um, obviously a lot of uh, macronutrients and micronutrients that you have to, um, be intaking, especially saturated fat. Um, but you'll notice they'll all have a little bit of overlap, but each one of them has just a little bit tidbit in there that's specific for that hormone. Mm-hmm. How to optimize testosterone in premenopausal women. So, yeah, I mean, again, pretty similar. Um, vitamin D is a steroid. Yeah, vitamin yeah, D. That's what I tell well. people. <laughs> Not a vitamin. But yeah, they all, you know, they all kind of have similar, you know, you need saturated fat, zinc, B vitamins, magnesium, all super important. You've got to have a good weight, good insulin, um, insulin level. You don't want to be insulin resistant. Um, you really don't want to have circadian rhythm dysfunction because that's also going to affect the HPA axis, which is going to mess with um, hormone production. And then thyroid is one that that's overlooked a lot, but um, under or over functioning of the thyroid can can cause infertility um, and menstrual irregularities, which is why even conventional obstetricians, if you're having um, issues with your cycle, they'll check your thyroid and, and see if there's any autoimmune disease. Um, or hyperthyroid, hypothyroidism, any of that. So it, it's all a, honestly a big symphony, but a lot of it is lifestyle, nutrients, sunlight, um, resistance training. Mm -hmm. The basics, right? Yeah, essentially. Basically. You know, at these A4M events, you know what they tell us, Sarah? They say, if you want to increase estrogen, consume soy, consume <laughs> edamame, <laughs> consume tofu, right? They do it. They actually tell women to do this if they want to improve their estrogen. I know. Well, I mean, yes, it works. So don't believe that when the, the IG influencer tells you that tofu doesn't increase estrogen, it does. And it can therapeutically increase estrogen. Right? And I mean, there are other ways too as well. Obviously, again, it's it all boils down to saturated fat. You do need right. to have saturated fat. But if, you know, some women can probably benefit from those isoflavones, which again, you can get that in supplement form as well. Um, right. With estrogen, you do really want to make sure if it's high, you want to address that as well, which we have down here a couple of things, dim detox, calcium deglucurate, um, milk thistle, all things to optimize detoxification in the liver and in the gut, because again, estrogen dominance um, can actually later on down the line lead to malignancy because right. it's a proliferative hormone. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it is important really for people to know. It's all of, levels as, as Dr. Pamela Gershaw, she says, she says all about balance, right? Right. Right. Balance the hormones. Right. 
Okay. Ah, oh, this is my mom. <laughs> this is Lynn. So she's very naturally minded. So she doesn't take any pharmaceuticals. She was a little bit resistant to doing this stuff, but uh, but what she was doing, well, she wasn't sleeping well at night. She couldn't wind down. So what she was doing was a glass of whiskey every night. Uh, not the best thing for sleep, right? But it did wind her down at night. So she was using that. Now she doesn't take it anymore now that we're doing hormones. Oh, so wow. the first hormone I introduced to her was progesterone. She takes 50 milligrams. Even that was too much for her. 40 milligrams. And she puts it in a shot glass. She mixes it and she takes it at night. That's how she takes the progesterone. Because she doesn't like the capsule because it's a blue dye. She's very natural. No blue dye in the capsule. Takes it as a shot glass. This. <laughs> what does it taste like? I, I didn't even know yeah, it could taste it like that. It doesn't matter. But uh, the point is that she no longer uses the uh, whiskey for sleep. Progesterone, she goes to sleep. No problem. And, uh, you know, she was all into anti-aging and biohacking, but she never got into hormones. And hormones is real anti-aging, okay? It really is. It really is. You can right. see that she needs more than just progesterone. Her, I mean, oh, her estradiol isn't that, actually that bad, 6.1. That's, though, probably from her own fat cells. She's just producing uh, estrogen from fat cells, most likely. Um, her testosterone, where was that? Testosterone, yeah, it's a little bit low, 12. Okay. Uh, her cortisol was all out of whack, super high cortisol in the morning, kind of high cortisol all day long, kind of like plummets at night. It may have been from the alcohol use that really messes with your sleep and your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. you know. Right. And then you don't get well, like a good quality sleep. And so that mm -hmm. further propagates the cycle. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what do we do? We start her with super low estrogen replacement. Because she listened to my lecture with Dr. Gersh. And Dr. Gersh said, if you want to use estrogen for anti-aging, you get it in a compound cream and you put it on the face. Mm -hmm. It can help with the wrinkles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Oh. Tinney, does, he likes that as well for his patients. Yeah, we've been using it topically. But she already had good estrogen, so we did a super slow, super tiny micro, 0 0.1. It's almost nothing, okay? Okay. Uh, progesterone was 100 milligrams, was way too much for her. She only does 40 now, especially <laughs> when combined with MK677. She loves MK677, growth hormone peptide, fantastic for sleep. She doesn't touch alcohol anymore because she has all this stuff. But 25, it was too much. She says she slept too deeply. She only does 10 milligram now. Okay. We also did a very low dose of TRT cream. She liked that one. And she also microdoses melatonin, 150 micrograms, very low dose. Anymore, she feels groggy the next day. Mm. Here's her salivary hormones now. So still a bit high morning awakening, but overall improved, much improved, more stable throughout the day. Um, interesting enough, her estradiol came up so high. And I was like, this is not possible at 0.1 milligrams. But what are you doing? And your progesterone is way too high. What did you do? And she was like, oh, I think I messed up the test. She took her shot of progesterone and she did the test. And so her saliva was full of the progesterone mm -hmm. Uh, Micronized progesterone. That makes sense. Yeah. And then the other thing she was doing that messed up this test, <laughs> she's doing that tretinoin on her face. She's doing a retinol on her face. Right. So it's an exfoliant. Right. And then she puts the estrogen on her face. So she becomes a super absorber of it, mm, right. which is a good tip for my colleagues. If you're having someone who says, who you find it's not therapeutic, hormones aren't going through the skin, retinol. It's exfoliant, remove those dead skin cells. And potentially you could kind of get around that problem. Mm -hmm. You probably give her some DHEA as well. Yeah, she but she cannot tolerate much. Mm. She wants to get like 2.5 milligrams from me. I don't even know where to find that. <laughs> That's the hormone cascade. Hormone cascade kind of sometimes interesting to look at where these all start. This is kind of like a good proxy mark, kind of give you kind of a, a mindset of where all these are. Here's yep. DHEA. Some say all, all of your sex hormones, men and women, it all starts with cholesterol, right? And our bodies can only make up to 75 to 80% only of our cholesterol needs. And that's just our needs for survival. We're not talking about optimization. So mm -hmm. if you're not eating cholesterol from animal fats, you're not going to optimize for your hormones, plain and simple. Wow, I didn't know that because I'm hearing so all the argument from the other gurus that don't like you very much that we can <laughs> make our own cholesterol. We don't need to eat it. Yeah, we may. Our liver makes it, but it's only up to 75 or 80% of 
uh, mm -hmm. that's it of your yeah. needs. So mm -hmm. yeah, what, what happens to the remainder 20%? And that's only if we're looking at our needs for survival, because usually like the RDAs or whenever they're calculating the needs for a certain nutrient, it's what's enough to keep you from dying. <laughs> you know, so our needs could be far higher than that if you really want to thrive, right? Uh -huh. And so, yeah, so that means you need way, way more cholesterol. You're, and even in the worst case scenario, you most certainly cannot make enough to optimize. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, this isn't, yeah, this is interesting. This is kind of what we touched on the very beginning. Yes, this is interesting. This is when you first got labs done. You were dealing with a bit of acne at the time. Mm -hmm. This is when I, and I had chin and jawline, which is, I mean, that's androgenic acne. Yeah, androgenic. that's what I had too. And you can see the reverse C3. So what happened with your thyroid? How did you, the, it was all from the diet and all of the, uh, the things that we talked about earlier that normalized it? Yeah, I think, you know, it was definitely, I mean, lifestyle related. So what I did was I cut out um, all gluten. I cut out pretty much like all sugar. Like I really wasn't eating like any sugar, any gluten. And you figure when you do that, that basically cuts out a lot of carbs as well. Um, I still was having, you know, things like a, you know, occasional squash, but once you cut out, you know, processed sugar and gluten, you, you are going to then also cut out a lot of carb sources. So I went a little over carb. I did cut out dairy, which I wasn't even, I was only drinking and eating like uh, pasteurized dairy anyway. I wasn't even doing the raw dairy at that point. So I had cut out all the pasteurized dairy, the sugar and the gluten and then my acne resolved and then I dropped like, you know, 30, 35 pounds. Wow. So, and you can see in my labs, I mean, my labs matched exactly what was going on. My DHT was high, which is the more potent form of testosterone is three times more potent than testosterone. Yes, and so that's what was driving my acne. Probably I was reacting to something with my um, thyroid. If you look at the reverse T3 and um, my testosterone was high. So I not only had high testosterone, but I had high DHT. So that was driving these deep cystic, painful acne lesions. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then estradiol is, you know, kind of, yeah, oh. kind of low for a luteal phase premenopausal woman on the low end, you could say. Right. Yeah. Right. Sex hormone binding globulin was surprisingly high. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very wacky. The lab, something was going on. I was probably reacting to something. Obviously, you know, my diet clearly wasn't good because it was showing in my skin. Right. And then, yeah, it talks about my lifestyle changes. It was February twenty two. You did a lot of herbs to suppress testosterone. I did. I, in addition to the dietary changes, I did basically some. Um, and really, I, they're anti-androgenic, but most of them targeted elevated DHT, not necessarily testosterone specifically, which I think is important to note because it's not testosterone alone that drives acne. It's typically the dihydrotestosterone that drives acne, So, which mine was uh, clearly elevated. And so a couple of those supplements like the red reishi, pumpkin oil, di um, salt palmetto, they all help. Um, block alpha five reductase, which lowers DHT. So I was doing some of these herbals. I was drinking spearmint tea. So I'm sure that also contributed to lowering my DHT levels and helping the acne. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The five alpha reductase inhibitors that you mentioned, all of these supplements, they block testosterone from being converted into its most potent form, which is DHT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is um, related to acne and also prostate um enlargement and yes i'm glad you mentioned that as well yep it causes and hair loss actually yeah. it can cause hair loss if you're genetically susceptible to it yeah yeah i mean that's a genetic lottery there yep. some guys they can do super high doses they don't even notice one single mm -hmm. hair strand loss yeah I think that's so this is interesting here you went pretty hard with the herbs i did and you suppressed that dht from 22 to 2.2 yeah <laughs> nice did it wow this herbs are potent that's very, that's huge from 22 yeah. to 2.8. That's amazing. Yeah. And that was, I mean, this was only a couple months, maybe like what it was like December to May, I think. And in that yeah. time, that's when I dropped probably the first like 20 pounds. February, Whoa. 
Man. Yeah, it was pretty quick. It was like I looked in the mirror one day and I was like, I think I've lost some weight. <laughs> and my, you know, without, my without even like trying to count calories or things like that. Yeah, no, I never once ever with counted a calorie. It was just this is the foods I'm going to eat and this is the foods I'm going to avoid. Wow. So yeah, it was very very Amazing. interesting. Yeah. The calcium D glucose, you got to be careful with that one too. It looks like it dropped the estrogen a bit. Mm, yep, that's probably what attributed the lower estrogen as well. It is potent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's your salivary panel, May 2022. And that was at the same time as the labs we just looked at where my DHT was lower than. Yeah. Right. Your cortisol is still high in the morning, 3.9. <laughs> As to 1.7, progesterone 93. <laughs> this is, I think we, this is when we first looked at it in the beginning of the slide as well. We yeah. Oh this. yeah, we did. We yeah. did rearrange these slides. So here's your labs on ketogenic diet. B12 still very nice. 17, insulin's low, 4.2. This all looks great. Estradiol 195, your estrogen come right back mm -hmm. up. Yeah, my sex hormones were not, you know, um, worsened in ketosis that's for sure good yeah fantastic 17.7 labs in december 2022 consuming carbs protein and fats versus labs on ketogenic diet february 2023 so you can see her ldl particle came up from 796 to 1460 mm -hmm. that may Make Wait, some the one the one on the right is the keto. This is the keto here. This is the consuming one, carbs per day here. Gotcha. So which is LDL. basically yeah, my I mean my LDL and my particle number came up. The others triglycerides yeah, are still triglycerides low. are ba basically the same. And then the HDL actually went up. Right. That's fantastic. This is what we really care about, right? The triglyceride, lower triglyceride, higher HDL. Um, with the LDL particle number, we don't really know. Is there a lot? There, it kind of doubled. Do you have any idea as to why that could have been? Well, I think, you know, when I was doing ketosis, <laughs> when I first started, keep in mind, it's like this was only three to four weeks on it. So it was still so acute. Right. When I first started doing the ketosis, I was actually, eat, I think I was eating more. Yeah. And I think, again, I think it was just the adjustment of my body still in that survival mode of, okay, you just stopped doing the carbs and I wasn't eating a lot of sugar to begin with, but you stop the carbs pretty much. You're not doing like any. And so in the very beginning, I was still eating quite a bit. So I think that might attributed to the particle number being so high is that I was still I mean, eating quite a bit, whereas I know once you kind of normalize on keto, you don't tend to really actually eat all that much. True. But it was still so acute that I was adjusting and I didn't gain any weight. I didn't lose any weight in that month, but I was in the beginning, I felt like I was still eating so much because I was adjusting to that change. So maybe that's why. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes you miss the carbs a little bit, um, that dopamine activation, and you try to get that somehow yeah. by overstretching the stomach a little bit and overeating, you know, the good foods if you want. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, the best test would be after being keto adapted for a while, for months, you know, then you would check it and you have a clear idea of what's going on. That's what I want to do is a longer, because I think a month is cool. I mean, it's good to kind of see maybe like those inflammatory markers, but I think as far as like cortisol and lipids, it's almost better to maybe do a longer stretch because it's still so, I mean, it, you're still really adjusting at three to four weeks. True, true, true. Now, this is what we saw earlier, your high cortisol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully that'll come down once you quit your job. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Uh, we do do consults. So you can get all this testing done. And you can do the salivary. You can do the blood draw. You can see if your cortisol is high. <laughs> right. And um, all of these tests, you can get them. Uh, so, so oh, so that, that price, 399 includes the lab for blood draw and a consult with Logan or Stefan. Yeah. That's a fantastic deal. Yeah. Yeah, nice. you get a lot checked. A lot of nice. cool stuff. Yeah. Awesome. 
All right. Is that the end of the slide? That's it. Show fantastic. So, where can people find you um, and give us a little bit of everything that you offer? I know that that was, you know, that that lab test panel uh, is is great, and people need to know that they can get all of the stuff for such a, a budget friendly amount. Uh, but you know, if they want anything else where can they find you guys yeah so we're iron direct primary care you can find us on the internet everywhere and instagram and youtube and you know are you still in instagram jail i feel like you, they've they've loosened up a little bit because now i can tag you and yeah good yeah, yeah, yeah he's taggable now i'm taggable now <laughs> it's gone for a while come back yeah. we have an office here in indy atlantic our beautiful office um but yeah we, we serve patients telemedicine all over the state and we're adding on new states all the time mm -hmm. and um so you moved from melbourne or is no it... indy atlantic is right near my house in melbourne indy atlantic is just by the beach here oh gotcha it is within melbourne mm -hmm. yes yeah, okay fantastic um i'll make sure that i link your instagram and logan's instagram as well in the description box below and also the link to your iron direct primary care website um, all the good stuff. If you have a link tree, I'll make sure I link that. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for sharing all of the good stuff with us today. Yeah. Yeah, it was great chatting. Awesome. And thank you everybody for sticking with us, Ali. And I hope this was helpful. If you want more content like this, make sure you let us know in the comment section below. And I will see you in the next one.